Welcome, uh, everybody. Um, it's a very warm, uh, unusually sweltering day here in the UK. So uh, welcome to everybody uh, joining us. Um, uh, I'm Adam Watts from uh, from Wrightington Hospital, and uh, um, this is another of the Medatis uh, uh, webinars on upper limb surgery. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to, to welcome Carlos Harris Blue from uh, the Pulvertaft Hand Centre in Derby. Uh, Carlos has huge uh, experience uh, and uh, has real uh, unique skills, which he often demonstrates to us and uh, shows us all up. Um, but uh, he's going to take us uh, through uh, management of uh, small joint arthritis in the hand. Uh, as always, I would be very grateful if you could keep your microphones uh, muted and uh, just for bandwidth, probably best to keep the, the, the video uh, not uh, off, so not stream your videos. Um, and uh, as always, please do fire in any questions on the chat, which we will then uh, put to Carlos at the end of his talk. So Carlos, thank you very much for, for joining us and I'll ha hand over to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Adam. Um, so I'm going to have a, a run through a um, small joint arthritis, which is quite a, quite a common issue, actually, because I thought, I, I don't think I do very many of these, but then when I looked at my diary, I do about one or two a week. Uh, they're not very memorable operations in that they're, they're, they're small operations. They're not difficult, but they're not forgiving. You need, you need, you need to get them right to uh, be able to get a good result. See if I can get this to advance. Uh, Carlos, you may just have to re stop sharing and, uh, and try. Let me try that. Let me try share screen again and put it up again. Oh, hang on, hang on, yeah, no, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll stop share and then I'll have it like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me get back there. See, try again. Um, so get that up. Yeah. And now I'll put it on slide from here. Yeah, that's better. Uh, first thing, just a, a, a small point. Uh, an arthrodesis is, a, is an operation, is a procedure you do to induce bone, uh, to grow between two bones to make one piece. A fusion is a biological process that happens and it may or may not happen after your arthrodesis. So, so when you um, when we talk, we often say, oh, I'm going to do a fusion. But if you, if you write a paper or a chapter or something, um, it's better if you, if you call it an arthrodesis. And we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that uh, today. Um, so the first thing is the, is the position you need to arthrodes things. And there's some debate. Um, the picture on the right is from Greens and is the one we all know. Uh, arthrodesis of the MCP is unusual. Uh, because the replacements, MCP replacements are, are very good and uh, an MCP arthrodesis is quite disabling. But PAP and DAP, proximal interphalangeal joint, distal interphalangeal joint are quite common. And these are the angles that are suggested uh, increasing from radial to ulna by five degrees on the PAPs. And then there is a debate about the best ideal position for the DIPs, but most people do it a straight or with a very slight flexion. Now, if you look at people when uh, holding an, ob an object, that's the kind of the position the fingers are when you're doing important things, like holding a glass of beer. Uh, there is increasing flexion as you go towards the ulna. And also, the little and ring fingers are mainly involved in grip. So you need to be able to grip a small objects, and for that, you need a lot of flexion. While well, index and middle are more involved in pinching against the thumb, and for that you don't need so much flexion. You don't want it so flexed. So we'll start from distal. We'll start talking about distal in the phalangeal joint. And this is the case, and I want to know what you think about this. It's a 55-year-old manual worker that comes with pain 
and instability at the distal interfalcial joint of the left index finger. And uh, what I want to know is what is the treatment you would propose? I'm going to have a poll now that you'll be able to see and vote. Um, Helena, feel free to show the poll when you want. And uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll tell you what the options are on the poll. Uh, there is an arthrodesis, which means uh, fusing the DAP. And you can do that with a circular wire, K wires, a screw. There is another operation, which is uh, chelectomy or debridement. And that's based on opening it up, excising the osteophytes, and um, closing it up again after washing it out. And there is some evidence that that's a good operation for, for some patients, and that's been, that's been published and recognized. Um, another operation is a, is a DIP joint innervation. And again, you know, there is some evidence that that works. It's not something we do very much, but has the advantage that preserves movements and gets rid of the pain. Now you could do a, a, a joint replacement, and then again, it's, it's well, well documented. Yeah. So those are the results of your poll. 85% of you will do an arthrodesis, 15% a galectomy, which is more than I thought, actually. Yeah, so that's, that's good. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. And then the next question I'm going to ask you is, since most of you agree that you do an arthrodesis, would you use just a longitudinal wire, circular wire, or an intermediary screw? I also want to know what position you would fix it in. Would you go for a straight joint? Would you flex it slightly? Or would you give it a good flexion? Taking into account that that's for an index finger. And that will also depend on the technique, on the technique you use. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna bias you by telling you my answers first, but we'll see, we'll see what, what you think about all that. So you need to mark more than one choice on this one. You need to mark one for the technique and one for the position. And we'll see what, what people say. We are starting to realize now that I just come here to learn from you, not to teach you anything. But uh, I admit to that. Um, Helena, show, show us the results of that if you've got Yeah, them. it's uh, half of the uh, half of that. only voted. Let's give it another 10 seconds, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, I'll just say that the, the, the commonest technique, I think, around the world by, of fixing the, the distal interfalcial gentle joint is with, with a screw, and headless screws are, are very popular. So let's have a look at that. So most people would do it open with an intermediary screw. 22% to do it percutaneous with an intermediary screw, which is good, good interesting. There is, there is evidence that that, that works. Uh, circular wire about 6% and just a longitudinal K wire about 6%. Yeah. And 50%, exactly half of you who fix it straight, and uh, just over a quarter of you fix it to be, be flexed, actually. Longitudinal K wire is a reasonable idea, but it doesn't give you compression. And actually, the person who introduced uh, the idea that compression is important for arthrodesis was John Chanley from Brightington. And he wrote a book about uh, using compression to arthrodesis, mainly big joints, ankles, knees. And people just laughed at him to start with, you know, because um, um, Watson Jones has said that you didn't need that. And then he was, he was proven right, actually. And, uh, and that's uh, another thing we have to thank John Charlie for. Good, so uh, most of you go with open intermediary screw. I agree with that. And most of you fix it straight. I also agree with that. For those of you that um, I would use circular wire, I'll just show you the technique. Um, it's not my preferred technique. And the reasons are you need to be good exposure for that. And what you do, you do a dorsal edge incision, and um, then you remove all the osteophytes. Could be stuck here with my PowerPoint for some reason. Uh, and uh, yeah, there you go. And you make two holes, transverse holes, one in the middle phalanx, one in the distal phalanx. You pass some steel wire, and then you put an oblique K wire there. Fix it with the K wire, 
tight on the circular wire and that's that's your operation but it needs a big bigger approach and and also um the 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 ky can be quite tender if it's a little bit proud and also the knot of the circular wire so my preferred technique would be to do um, a screw and because osteoarthritis have very hard bone and osteophytes, I prefer to do it open. If he was a rheumatoid patient uh, without too much osteophytes, I would probably do it closed. And that has some advantages when you're doing rheumatoid hand surgery because you will be doing multiple procedures at the same time. And in 10 minutes, you have, you have the joint arthritis percutaneously very easily. So I will do a small age incision flex the joint. Whenever you do an arthrodesis, it's good to formally divide the collateral ligaments by running the plate of your knife between the bone and the proximal insertion of the collateral. Once you've done that, the joint will open much more and will be balanced. It won't be pulling more one side than the other. So the next thing I do is with a wrong chair or a bone nibbler, take, take the cartilage and the hard bone, leave, leave cancellous bone with cancellous bone. I don't use a saw, I don't use a burr, I think that can hit the bone, and then if you, if you burn it even slightly, it will delay your healing, and it's not necessary. Then I'll put the K wire, and I'll put it in the distal phalanx from proximal to distal, get it out that way, then reduce it, and advance the K wire. And the K wire has to be central, central in both views, yeah? That's important. And then I'm going to rim it, and I'm going to rim it to the narrow part of the middle phalanx, but not beyond. The screws we use nowadays are self-drilling, self-tapping, so there is no need to, to, to rim the whole thing. Uh, and then I'll choose my screw. Most of the time I'll use a three millimeter diameter screw. For a little finger in a lady, I'll probably use a 2.2. And it depends on the size of the finger, really. And <laughs> I want the, the, the tip of my screw in the narrow part of the middle phalanx. And I want the trailing end of my screw in the wide part of the distal phalanx and possibly not under the nail. Because under the nail, the, the distal phalanx is quite narrow. And if you, get, uh, if you cut into the bone there and titanium seeps out, it makes you a, a spot in the in the in the in the matrix of the nail, and that that doesn't look good. And I've I've, I've seen cases where the screw has had to be removed, and you, you don't need that. So the other thing is that because I sink the uh, a screw into the bone, I need a screwdriver that can do that. And if you see a good set have a screwdriver where the tip of the screwdriver is uh, narrower than the rest of the shaft and that's so the couple of centimeters can go into the bone. So that is the diameter of the core of the screw. So when I get the screw in, that bit of a screwdriver can go in a fair bit. You need to bear that in mind because if you try to do that with a screwdriver that wider than the screw, you will split the bone distally. And I know of cases where that has happened. As you advance the screw, it will compress your arthrodesis and people in the audience will know more than me about that, but the compression it gives you is 0.1 of a millimeter per full turn. So it's a fair amount of compression when you get it that deep. And then take the screwdriver out, take the cable out, and that's your arthritis is done. So that's what we did with this one. And that feels very nicely. Sort it. And the same thing you can use for the thumb. Uh, sometimes I uh, put a little bit longer screw, but a three millimeter screw fits very well. And in rheumatoid surgery, I'll do it uh, percutaneously. Osteoarthritis, I'll open it up and take the osteophytes off. So this is another case uh, of a lady that was sent to me with distal interphalagial joint osteoarthritis of the right middle finger. She's 62, she's retired, but she does lots of crafts, sewing, knitting, uh, works for a charity, very active lady. And she had a lot of pain and swelling at the DIPJ middle finger. Now, the thing about her is that she's got bath osteoarthritis in many joints and has an ankylose proximal interphalangeal joint. And now she comes with pain at the distal interphalangeal joint. The proximal interphalangeal joint is well fused, 
not painful and it's straight. And she wants to know what can we do for the distal interphalangeal joint. So I want to know your opinion now about what do you do with this lady who comes to you with a ankylosed PIP joint and a painful but mobile DIP joint who uses her fingers a lot for crafts and it's important to her that she carries on doing that. Would you arthrodis the distal interphalangeal joint, do a lectomy debridement, do a denervation, or would you do a joint replacement for them? Now, joint replacement is not so common in the, in the DAPJ, but it's well described and well, good results published. Uh, same, same with uh, the nervation, actually. And I, I think sometimes that every time I do one of these arthrodises, I'm doing a denervation as well, you know. So it's part, it's part of the procedure. Maybe some of my success is doing the denervation. So 43% of you would still do an arthrodisis. 30% uh, would do a calectomy debridement, 13% of denervation, 13% of joint replacements, yeah. So, so divided opinions, I, I would expect this, because these this ones, when, when you take into account the rest of the hand is when it gets a bit, a bit tricky, you know. Uh, for her, I actually uh, put a little Swanson replacement and, and she did very well. And because all the pull of FDP goes to move the distal interphalangeal joint and not the proximal, she got, she got good movement actually. And she didn't like the idea of having a middle finger completely straight, you know, that can, that can be, can look a bit rude when you go through life like that. Uh, okay, let's move on from this. Um, it, it, these operations are not difficult, but they're not forgiving. Uh, you need to get it right. Uh, Non-union uh, using a, an intermediary screw is, is very rare, actually. You know, but but it can happen, like in this case, which was interesting because the one we operated on didn't unite, but the next one that we didn't operate on fused spontaneously. So we had an interesting situation. But I just took that the screw out. That was a 2.2. Put a three millimeter, and then with a bit of compression, it settled. Uh, Mouth position is important, and sometimes people do do funny things. Like some people have the idea that in manual work is they need more flexion for gripping, and they use a bigger screw. And this guy got everything. He got a non-union, got a screw protruding at the top, and he went through the skin and he had an infection. So don't try to do things like that. Just to stick to techniques that we know work. So this is another case, and now we're moving to the PAPJ. It's a 23-year-old that was involved in a fight eight months before uh, for several reasons. He didn't have um, uh, any care, and he's ended up like that. By the way, you can see my little uh, a thumbnail uh, video of me talking, and if you grab it from above it, you can move it around in the screen wherever you want. Yeah. So if it's if it's covering part of the slides or whatever, you can you can move it. You can move it wherever you want. So this guy uh, is eight months from injury. Um, he has about ten degrees of movement at his approximate tenfaltial joint, and that movement is very painful. The joint is stiff and swollen, and he has tried splints and had an injection and all that kind of thing, but he's not getting on with that. He wants a more definitive solution. So what I want to know is what would you do for him? And Helena is going to show us the poll for this one. And the options I've given you is, would you do a uh, denervation of the PIP joint, which is a well-described procedure as well? You could do a colectomy or debridement, or you could think that uh, you should arthrodesist or do a replacement, or you could think that this is an intraarticular fracture that is placed and try to do an intraarticular osteotomy, which um, eight months on the line, it may not be easy, and it will depend on, on how the cartilage is. So all these, are, all these are possible options, and sometimes you need to discuss them 
with the patient for, for informed consent, yeah. So more than half would go for arthrodesis, a few of them, chalectomy, derivation, and a joint replacement. The joint replacement bunch are, are brave, I think, you know, because to do a joint replacement, you need good collateral ligaments. And here, one is in one place, the other one is in the other place. I don't know how, I, I didn't know how to balance that, actually. I thought carefully about that. Uh, the other thing I haven't told you about this guy is that he, uh, the reason he wasn't treated is because he's in prison. And he has a, a history of alcohol, drug abuse, and all kinds of things. So I thought I thought not the best candidate for a, for a replacement in this case. And we went for an arthrodesis. So my next question is, if you uh, were going to arthrodesis, this, uh, how would you do it? Would you use a uh, longitudinal K wire and uh, a round circlage, uh, tension band wiring, and that means two longitudinal K wires with a figure of a dorsal circlage? Would you use intermediary screw, which you can do? Uh, or would you do a dorsal plate or some other device? There are specific devices that are designed for, um, for PIP arthrodesis these days. And some people use that and they're quite familiar and quite happy with, it, with their results, which makes the operation more expensive, uh, but it uh, makes it easier technically, actually, in some, in some cases. So most of you would go for dorsal plating, very good. Uh, tension band wiring, a third, intermediate screw, nearly a quarter, that's, that's very good. I'm glad nobody would just go for longitudinal K wire. Uh, because that's that's probably not not enough. Uh, so that's brilliant, actually. Uh, so uh, how do we go about doing one of these? And dorsal approach to the PAPJ, and you can do a longitudinal incision, or you can raise a distally based flap. That's called the chame flap of extensor tendon, and chame draws it as a V. If I do that, I raise it a bit more as a rectangle, so I can put it back. Uh, which one you use, I don't think it matters very much because the central slip is going to stick down, which it doesn't matter because you're fusing the joint. But the lateral bands need to run and need to run well. So you need to be very careful to not damage the lateral part of the extensor mechanism and not do anything that's going to get it scarred up. So how do it? is dorsal approach, um, get into the joint. Again, formally divide the collateral ligaments by dividing the proximal insertion of the ligaments. And then I get the bone nibbler or a ronger and take those surfaces down to a cancellous bone. That is important. The, if you look at the classical technique for this, they'll say, well, take a saw and cut it flat. Uh, that has a couple of problems. First, the saw can hit the bone. I don't like that. And then, once you've done your cat, you are committed to that angle. Well, if you do a, a roundy bit into roundy bit, you can dial in as much flexion as you want. So you can still adjust it. And it has another advantage, and is that if you do like a cylinder in a cylinder, you cannot mal rotate it. Well, if you do a flat surface against a flat surface, sometimes you can get confused and, and mal rotate it a bit. So I would advise you not to cut it flat. Just get a ronger and take, take, take the bone. You need some nice little rongers for this. And then use a couple of KYs, 1.1 or 1.25 millimeter diameter KYs are great. And uh, what we do then is make a transverse hole in the base of the middle phalanx and pass some surgical malleable steel wire. Uh, in the hospital, they have usually two types of wire. They have surgical steel malleable wire and they have dental wire. And uh, uh, the dental wire, it's got a lot of memory. It's difficult to handle. So, so if somebody offers you the dental wire, say, no, I want the other one, uh, because it's difficult to get you not buried as well. So get that pass it through the uh, middle phalanx, and then get your K-wires and pass it into the bone. Just realize that this is gonna determine the angle you're gonna do your arthrodesis, yeah? So pass it there, and then you are committed to that angle, 
pass the other one as parallel as you can. If you have them parallel, then your compression will allow the two bones to come together. If they are not parallel, it's more difficult to, to slide because it locks you into that position. So as parallel as you can, and then you reduce that at the right angle and just push them in. Now, the, the, the tip when you put the wires in is to uh, put them at very low speed with your KY driver and push reasonably hard. If you do that, it won't go through the cortex. If you hit the cortex, it will slide on the cortex and will advance. It's, it's a little bit like if you're putting it by hand, really, nearly. So, so very little, very little speed. And then if you, if you look at my post-op x-rays, it looks like the wires are bent most of the time, you know? And that's because I put it under, under low speed, but high pressure, and it just skids on the inside of the cortex rather than perforate the cortex. Then do a figure of eight, and the, again, you know, the classical way of doing that for big orthopedic surgeons is to have two knots, one on each side, so you can balance the tension. I don't think that's necessary here. I just do one knot on one side, and I do it at the level of the joint. And there's a little bit of gap on the dorsum of the joint, and I'll just fold my knot in there to make it really flat. So you lift the knot there and you push it into the joint. It doesn't disturb the healing, and the patient cannot feel it. If the patient feels it, it's going to be a bit tender, and then they'll want the wires removed, uh, which means doing another operation. If you leave it all really flat, uh, then uh, it's very rare. You need to you need to take the the wires out, and then the next thing is to get the two K wires correct and flush, and it's very difficult to bend this wire down onto the bone. So the thing to do is you bend it upwards by the same angle or more that than there is between the wire and the bone. When you bend it up, cut it, and then rotate it 180 degrees while you're pushing in. And we'll get really flush with the bone, then do the same with the other one, and that's your construct. And remember that that works as a tension bound wire, so it doesn't look like a lot of metal work, but mechanically works very well because if you think that in the arthrodesis it would be compression on the volar side and tension on the dorsal side, by putting a tension bound wire you get compression on both sides and that helps the healing. So that's what it looks in real life. Uh, 2K wires parallel, push them in and you pass the, uh, can you see how those wires, in, it looks like they're bending a bit. That's because we just, we just push them in, ease them in gently rather than, if you had put that at high speed with the drill, you'd have gone through the cortex. And then you do figure of eight, uh, tighten it up, bend the wires up, cut them, turn them. And that's, that's how you should look. You should, if you run your finger over that, it should feel really nice and smooth and then just close it up. And that's what we did with this guy. We did that and we basically did them following up. We only following up by the phone. And he came to have an exo, but that healed very well, got rid of his pain, and he could go back to his, to his normal activities. But this is another case. It's, it's, it's a bit of a sad case, you'll see. This is a guy who um, plays cricket, and uh, two years ago had an injury to the little finger, PAP fracture dislocation and they, he had a, he had an X fix like this and got infected, got osteomyelitis and ended up with an amputation of the little finger. So two years ago comes back with another fracture dislocation this time, right? Goes to the same place and they put the same X, X fix. This time he was, he was lucky they took it earlier, took it out earlier so he didn't get an infection but the joint remained, remained very painful. Uh, and I think that's because if I take you back to the beginning, there's a fracture dislocation, but there is a central part of it that's a bit depressed. That central part has no ligaments attached to it, so you can do as much ligamentotaxis as you want, that's not going to move. And uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't do very much with it, it was very painful, any movement. And then they got a CT and they demonstrated they had an intraarticular malunion of this and he couldn't do what he wanted. Uh, so he gave up the idea of, of playing cricket and they offered him um, a PIP replacement. But there were problems post-op and he ended up with a very fixed uh, boutonniere. He had further surgery there to release the contracture 
fixed flesh on contractual PIP and try to tighten the extension mechanism, but that recurs shortly afterwards. So he decided to come and see me. He, he was seeing where this finger was going again, you know, and, um, and I, I took that out and, and I fused it. And because I had to breach that, that gap, and I, I filled it up with a bone graft from the distal radius, that's what I normally do, and put, and put these plates. And I quite like these plates because uh, you have two rows of, of screws that give you a good fix, but also the screws are lateral, they're not in the middle of the phalanx. So if they're a little bit long, they'll hopefully go lateral to the flexor tendons and not in the middle of the flexor tendon, which would be a, a problem. So that's, that's a good technique that I recommend if you have one that's a bit difficult. A downside of it is that uh, you need more dissection. Uh, the uh, lateral bands of the sensor tendon can get adherent and you may have a poor DAPJ movement. And I find that I have to go back more often and uh, take the plate out and do a tenolysis and I tell that to the patient before the first operation. So they know that they're probably signing for two operations here. So what are the complications of this? Uh, Non-union, uh, it is uh, rare, but it happens malunion. This is uh, one lady with a small little finger that had this arthrodesis. And that, that looks very good, it healed, healed very nicely. However, it was mal rotated, and what happened is that every time she flexed the little finger and got underneath the ring finger, and she was very distressed by that. So I had to do a, a derotation osteotomy. So I took that, those wires out and just derotated it, uh, which was fine. Uh, but that just because people rely a lot on the x-rays and it's difficult to see the rotation on the x-rays. So the lesson from this one is always look clinically. Um, do a tenolysis test and see where the finger is going before you 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 tighten your fixation. Uh, that's one that uh, had psoriatic arthropathy. This is a case of Graham, um, and he, this was clever. They they tried to fuse the PAP and the DIP with the same device. Unfortunately, pro proximally didn't didn't fuse, which which then leaves you <laughs> with a big hole. Uh, mental irritation can be a problem and infection can be a problem. Uh, this is another, another case uh, I'm going to show you. And this is somebody who um, had a, an injury at work and had the ulnocolateral ligament avulsion that was repaired with a little um, bone anchor, but he carried on having instability of the MCP, which was uh, troublesome for his, for his manual work. Uh, so, uh, the uh, instruction using palmaris, you can just see the tunnels in the proximal phalanx and the metacarpal, put the K-wire across. Unfortunately, this got uh, badly infected. The K-wire had to come early and it was pouring past. Took several debridements to get that sorted. And he had a lot of, uh, a lot of infection, took, took a long time for this to settle, long-term antibiotics and all that. Eventually, it, it, did, it did settle, uh, but it was very painful and very stiff. Any movement was very painful. So um, that's what it looked like when, when I saw him. Uh, and he couldn't use this thumb at all, which was very disabling, actually. So I thought we would, we would fuse that once I was sure that the infection has settled. And you could argue with this, but uh, I tend to do my MCPs arthrodesis the same that I do the, the PIPs with, with a tension band wire. Here it is a little bit more difficult because um, you want to fix it at about 10, 20 degrees of flexion. So it makes it more difficult to use a tension band wire, and that's why more people use a plate for this. But I, I, I did that, and I thought I thought it was all right, looked okay, but it didn't it didn't heal. Uh, pain was okay, but he still when he pressed, uh, it was bothering him. So what I did, I went I went back, took it out, and in one of the holes of the KY, I put a, a long kind of like the screw, and then he was fine for a few months and then he fell over and started being painful again. And probably had not healed properly and he cracked that. 
So just through a small hole, I, I took that screw out and put a bigger screw, give it a bit more compression, and then, then finally, finally held. So this one demonstrates several techniques for the MCP arthrodesis, and it is rare that they don't unite, in my experience, but it can happen. So you need to, you need to be careful with that. Uh, and then I'll just show you one, one last case. And uh, this is uh, something that sometimes puzzles you, which is a guy who comes and he's got a lot of thumb pain. Since he had a fall, he drives a four-leaf truck and the four-leaf truck tilted, he fell. He was inside the cage, so he was protected, but he hit his thumb in the, in the mesh that, that protects him. It's like, like a metal, metal grid. And since then, it's been, it's been very painful, the whole thumb. So he went to his local hospital and they decided he had uh, early CMC osteoarthritis. But they put the steroid injection and, and, and with local anesthetic and that didn't make it any better, which raised the question. So he came to see me and he was adamant that the pain was not coming from there. The pain was coming from the uh, uh, MCP joint, which on the x-ray doesn't look too bad. But uh, uh, clinically, it seemed, it seemed that. So originally, he was preferred for a trapezectomy or, a, or some CMC joint replacement. But when I saw him, I, I believed him. I said, look, I think, I think you're right. I think it may be from the, from the MCP. So what I do with these guys, I just bring them in and put a stout, stout K wire across the MCP and just send them to do their job. If that settles the pain, then uh, sorting out the um, the uh, MCP joint to sort out his problems and not risk operating on the wrong joint, which would be doing something at the CMC joint. And I put quite a big K-wire because I want them to be able to use it and not break the K-wire. That would be a, a minor disaster. And then I see them again in about four weeks. And if that has abolished the pain, like it was in his case, he said, yeah, I can work with this. You know, I can, I can, I can do everything. Then I, what I do, I, I take the K-wire out quite quickly. Don't, don't give it time for this to cause complications. And at the same operation, just, just arthrodis them. And that, that sorted out, sorted out his, his problem. Uh, so overall, uh, MCPJ arthrodesis of the thumb is an excellent procedure. Uh, you can do it with a tension band wire or you can do it with a plate. There are specific plates designed for this as well. Some people use staples. You can use one or two longitudinal screws. Uh, but all these, all these uh, operations, um, uh, they have to be done meticulously. There is no room for technical error. If you get it two millimeters wrong, it's not, it's not gonna work. And if you look at the literature, honest people have reported up to 20% complication rate, which is a lot for an operation. But if it is done well, I find that it works very well and patients are very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So that's my 40 minutes, Adam. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Carlos. Uh, thank you very much. Really uh, lovely uh, cases. Uh, please do uh, fire in your uh, questions for Carlos on the, uh, on the chat. Um, Carlos, if I may, I'll just uh, just um, get the ball rolling and starting starting distally on the on the finger. Uh, you showed a technique using uh, an H flap um, for approaching the DIP joint. Do you, have you seen complications of distal flap necrosis with that technique? Do you take special measures to to try and avoid that complication? Or is it not yeah, I mean, most, most of the time, uh, it's, it's, it's a transverse incision over the DIPJ with a little bit of extension, very little, to put the screw in. You, you don't need very much. And this is the only operation where you cut all the way through down to bone. Don't, don't dissect the skin from the extensor tendon. Keep it all as one piece uh, and then treat it very carefully. Don't grab it with the forceps or things like that. And then in my experience, it heals very well. And, and part of it is because if you fuse the joint, you've taken the tension of that skin. So even if you even put the stitches, it will still help. Uh, 
So I've, I'm, I've personally not have any any trouble with that. Now, if you if you do a circular wire, you need more exposure of it, and um, and and then you may have trouble with that. And if you go too much into the sides, uh, you may prank the dorsal branch after the trifurcation of the digital nerve, and that can be very painful. Yeah. So 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 the trick here would be do it with a with a small incision. And you honestly don't need a don't need a big incision. I mean, people say that well, it is tight actually. But if you make a small incision and just run your knife between the bone and the collateral ligaments, so you take all the collateral ligaments, you can open the joint quite nicely. So that's that's what limiting your access is not it's not the skin. You don't need you don't need a big incision there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you covered uh, uh, Carlos a lot of uh, nice techniques and really sort of in great detail nice uh, tricks for, for telling us how to do those things have you have you experienced with other uh, fixation devices such as staples uh, the dip joint uh, staples have the advantage that makes the operation quicker uh, but they 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 are difficult to hide and 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 uh, patients that fill them in my experience uh, so, so we played with the staples uh, quite a while ago, but I wasn't I wasn't very persuaded by it, and and they were more expensive, um, for the same result. So, so I've not I've not used them very much. But it it does make the procedure very quick. That 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 is true actually. Yeah. And when you're using a, a dorsal place, and it can be the same issue I think with some of the staples as well. What are your tips for achi achieving uh, compression? As you say, John Charnley has taught us that that's uh, really important. Um, and with a dorsal play, it can be difficult to achieve adequate compression. Do you have tips for, for doing that? Um, well, the, the, the thing about the plays is that I tend to use the plays for, for the ones that have a defect. Um, so I don't want to shorten the finger too much. And and sometimes what you want to do is is the, the bending of the plate, I think, is crucial because that's going to determine the position the finger ends in. Uh, so you need to bend it carefully, mold it carefully. Uh, but but then instead of going for compression, fix it where it should be and pack pack the graft really, really tightly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just, could could you just expand uh, for the audience as to why you worry about shortening the digits? So if you were converting a, 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 a PIP joint arthroplasty to a, an arthrodesis, uh, what would be your concerns about shortening the digit? Um, the, 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 the concern from the point of view of the, of the, of the patient is, is cosmetic. My, my concern is that if I shorten the digit, uh, the extensive mechanism becomes relatively long. So the lateral bands will not pull enough because the central slip is going to be stuck down and you're going to get like a mallet. So you're going to have a bent PIP and a bent DIP, mm. which, which is not, which is not great. PIP, don't they? Yeah. They hit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's very difficult to adjust, actually. It's very difficult to know what, what to do about that. Uh, you can go and divide the central sleep and try to let the stencil mechanism come proximal and things like that, but it's, it's, not, it's not brilliant. Um, so we've had a question in from, uh, from Philip Matthew, who's asked about PIP joint hemiarthroplasty. So in the, I assume this is for, for trauma scenarios. Do you have thoughts about that? Uh, very occasionally we've used it, uh, and, and it gets you out of... Um, it gets you out of trouble sometimes. Um, the I don't know what the long-term follow-up is like. I think I think that the line may end up eroding the other side. Uh, but if you have a trauma situation where the condyles of the proximal phalanx are destroyed or, or there is a piece missing, it's reasonable to do that. And the other trick is at the at the DAPJs. And this is people who've been in a car accident and they've abraded the, the dorsum of the hand on the tarmac. They, 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 they abrade the dorsum of the DAPJ. DAPJ is completely uh, not there. 
or break it, the dorsum of it. So you have a skin defect, you have tendon defect, and you have a joint defect, and, and it's a difficult situation. What you can do is put a little Swanson replacement, that, like, like that one I, I put in the, I show you for that lady with the stiff um, PIP. And you put a Swanson replacement, uh, you have the joint that will allow them to flex. But the thing I didn't realize till recent times is that it will give you, it will give you passive extension so you don't need to reconstruct the extensor. So all you need to do, you put a little Swanson's, you rotate it also flat, and you've got it covered. And there's a series published from Zurich that shows very good results of that. And that, that again, gets you out of trouble when you have these guys that have abraded the dorsum of the hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the index finger, Carlos? In your, for, for, what's your preference? So if you have somebody... Uh, uh, with dominant hand, index finger, PIP joint uh, arthritis, do you have a preference between fusion and uh, arthroplasty for the PIP joint and the index? Well, I, 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 I tell them that uh, doing, doing a replacement um, has a significant risk because of the lateral force of the thumb on the, in, on the, on the, on the index finger. And also, um, replacements are, are good at keeping movement and um, keeping function. They are not good at increasing movement and they are not good at correcting deformity. So if the finger is already deformed and quite stiff, in my hands, doing a replacement doesn't, doesn't make it all that much better, to be honest. Uh, so, it, so it all depends. Now, if it's somebody who's got more delicate hands and is reasonably straight, it's just painful, they've got a the reasonable movement and they want to keep it. I think it's reasonable to, to, put, to put the replacement in. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and for rheumatoids, I'll, I'll sometimes put a replacement in, but I'll put, I'll put a silicone replacement from a volar approach. And they seem to do well, well with that. Is the volar approach your preferred approach? approach generally for arthroplasty or, or for, for 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 PAPs if I put if I put silicone ones I'll, I'll, I'll put them I'll put them volar yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I think the patient just it, just it makes it makes it a bit more difficult for you makes it much easier for the patient and, and the movement they get is very very good and you have people who have already had um, a distal interphalangeal joint arthrodesis and they come with a bad uh, PIP and you're not quite sure what to do, you know, you don't want to completely stiff finger and you get forced into pushing the indication, really. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, Carlos, if you can share your thoughts about rehabilitation after these sorts of surgeries. So I guess uh, if you're using uh, uh, plates, tension band wirings for arthrodesis and, you know, what would be your protocol? And for uh, arthroplasties of the PIP joint, what would be your rehab protocols post-op? Uh, for, uh, for arthrodesis, um, the theory is that if you do a tension band, uh, a bit of movement is good. So, so I try not to protect them too much. But the thing that is very important is that they can move in the DIP very early. So, so the first couple of weeks, they'll probably just have a, a soft bandage. And then sometimes I make them a little shorter splint for the PIP so they can move the MCP and the DIP and get going and, gi and give them a bit of protection. They feel safer with that. They feel, they feel, they feel a bit vulnerable without that. But th even that, 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 that puts some compression around, again, across the joint. And in fact, as I was saying before, non-union is, is extremely rare. Uh, so I mean, they probably don't need protecting very much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, PIP arthroplasties, uh, then uh, that just depends a bit more about what it looked like and things. But the idea is, is to go for uh, early movement as much as we're confident. So, so I'll, I'll see them very early after the operation and sit down with one of the therapists. They're going to keep a close eye on them uh, because the reason we do it is to keep movement, isn't it? So, so, so. You, don't, you don't want to lose that, but you have to be very careful. Um, so Alan Amos has asked about percutaneous verse versus uh, open screw placement. What's, what's the disadvantage of the percutaneous techniques in osteo? 
the percutaneous technique, well, the patient comes to see you because the joint is painful, but also it's got some big bumps. If you do percutaneously, you're not going to take the big bumps. So, so, so particularly women don't like that. They want to get rid of the lumps. So if you're going to get rid of the lumps, uh, you're going to have to open it. So you're going to have to open it, just divide it. And, and, um, and, and there is a small but significant rate of non-union in osteoarthritics. Well, for example, if you do it on, in a rheumatoid that hasn't got big osteophytes and, and rheumatoid joints seems to want to fuse, you do it percutaneously, it's much easier and, and it, works, it works very well. So it depends on, depends on the patient, but the advantage of percutaneously is, is, is minimum trauma at the time of, of surgery and, and, and the operation is very straightforward. And, and these screws we have now, they're they are very, very good, very reliable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Ladan uh, Hajipur has asked about DIP joint replacement, um, uh, positioning of that, uh, or I guess your technique for, for doing DIP joint uh, replacements, where you do it. Yeah, no, a couple, a couple of words on that. There are two companies in the UK that distribute um, silicone implants and the sizes are not the same. So you need to be careful with that because um, you, need, you need to have a zero and a zero zero on the set because you need a very small implant. So what you don't want to do is be in the situation where you prepare everything and then the implant is still too big. So just, just, just be careful with that. Uh, and then there are two techniques with, with that. You can do a dorsal approach and uh, divide the extensor mechanism like a Z. And then that was modified by David Elliott, uh, leaving the, the extensor tendon intact and get, getting through both sides of the extensor tendon. So what you do, you, you, you keep the extensor tendon and you get between the extensor tendon and the side of the finger. And that works quite well and they rehab quicker. So, so I, I'm, I'm keen on uh, keeping, keeping the extensor tendon attached rather than repairing it because you get less additions and they seem, they seem to move well. It's, it's, not, it's not an operation for everybody, but uh, if it's somebody who's got all the joints in the same finger that are limited, uh, having that DAPJ movement is important. And the other thing that as well took, took, took me time to realize why they like it is because for certain things you do, it's like, it's like if I hold my pen, I don't know if I can show you this. If I do that, what I want is a bit of hyperextension. Yeah? So if I've got a replacement, I can do that quite nicely. But if I, if I got it fused like that, I'm, I'm loading on the tip, I'm not loading on the pulp. And, 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 and people like that little bit of hyperextension, particularly if you've got a fixed flexion in the, in the PIP. So I think that's a good operation and, and not done often enough. Yeah, very good. I, I don't know if you do it, Carlos, but uh, um, in sort of young manual work, as I've in the past done uh, a, a number of CMC joint uh, base of thumb fusions, um, and sometimes they can come back later, a few years later with um, uh, MCP joint arthritis, symptomatic painful MCP joint arthritis. Do you have any worries about multi-level fusions in the thumb? Uh, yes, no, the, the, the uh, CMC joint fusion is not an operation I do very often, but it was done in our department a fair bit. And, and the other disconcerting thing is that they'll, they'll come up 18 months down the line, and, and they're having pain around the same side, not exactly the same pain. And uh, what's happened is that you fuse the trapezium to the metacarpal, but they've loosened up the, the trapezial trapezoid joint. Okay, so the way I think about it, there is a central block in the hand, which is the distal carpal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate, and the index and middle metacarpals. And the ligaments between them are so strong that there is hardly any movement between these bones. And then the thumb, the ring, and the little are planted on that and they have more movement to be able to cup your hand and use it. So you effectively are nailing the base of the thumb to the central block of the hand. And that's, that's gonna create a lot of stress and they're going to have to, to adjust. And of course, the, the, MC, the CMC 
is going to be affected and the trapezoid trapezoid joint is going to be affected and then you have a difficult situation there so i've got a collection of these where i've done an arthrodesis at the mcp joint and have done a trapeziectomy after being fused to give them a bit of a bit more movement down there and that, that sort of works it's, it's a bit patient thinks it'd be weird you know so well, why didn't they do this in the first place you know well, i don't know you know <laughs> i wasn't there yeah yeah, yeah. simple um well last question carlos do you have any worry about smokers when you're doing your uh, arthrodesis uh well, one of my uh, main functions in the clinic is to stop people smoking. I give them, I give them the whole lecture. Uh, I, I, and, uh, and we talk a lot about it. I think smoking is bad in general, and, and it does has a, a deleterious effect. I mean, a couple of the ones that I've shown you, like that guy with the infection and all that, that didn't heal several times. He was a heavy smoker, and I, I couldn't get him to quit. Or, well, yeah, he did quit for two weeks, and then when he gets stressed, he goes and smokes again. Um, so, I, but but I, I I will not cancel the operation because there's smoke. Mm -hmm. I think that's ethically wobbly. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, great, Carlos. Absolutely brilliant, fantastic cases, fantastic teaching as always. Thank you very much indeed, um, and uh, thanks for, for taking the time uh, to, to share all that with everybody. Uh, for everybody, uh, next week we have Jeff Hughes in what is the last in the series, um, and he's going to be talking at 11 a.m. Central European Summer Time. That's 10 a.m. in the UK, um, and he's talking about complications following elbow surgery and ways to get out of those complications. Once again, Carlos, many thanks for your time. Everybody have a lovely weekend and stay safe. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for having me. And thanks to all the participants for sharing this time with us. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Carlos. Bye-bye.